Some scenes in this program have been reenacted, including the depiction of certain crime scene investigations. It was Mother's Day, May 13, 1984, a warm spring afternoon near Tampa, Florida. After spending time with their moms, two boys raced off to fly parachutes made from plastic bags. It was the perfect way to spend a Sunday. But soon, the wind brought a foul smell. They went off to investigate and found a site they would remember for the rest of their lives. What the boys found was the body of a nude woman lying in the roadside weeds. The medical examiner determined she had been there for about three days. Her wrists were bound behind her back, and a rope with a trailing extension was tied around her neck like a leash. Bruises, blisters, and insects covered her body. But it was the position of the corpse that told detectives this was not a typical murder case. Major Gary Terry, then Lieutenant Terry, had just been appointed head of the Hillsborough County Major Crimes Unit when he got the call. But the unique thing about the, the body to me was the fact that her legs were spread about five foot, five foot one inches apart from heel to heel. Uh, a scene that I'll never forget and, and a scene that I've never seen before. The pose was so grotesque, the body seemed to have been positioned that way deliberately. Had the killer meant to shock whoever found it? Crime scene technicians photographed the body and measured its distance from the road. They carefully packaged what little evidence was left, some cloth tied in a knot. Detective Pops Baker of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department also found tire tracks. He worked that night to make plaster casts. Tire casts can reveal the make and size of tires to help experts deduce the size and type of car a criminal is driving. They can also link him to a crime scene. Meanwhile, the body was brought to the medical examiner's office with the ligatures in place for him to study and photograph. The medical examiner determined the victim had been raped, then strangled to death. The brutality of the crime brought a sense of urgency to the investigation. Fearing this would not be an isolated case, Lieutenant Terry immediately contacted the FBI's forensics lab in Washington, D.C. Terry had a detective hand carry the evidence to the FBI lab. He had learned during an earlier case that doing so expedited the processing of evidence and brought the FBI in as an immediate active partner. The FBI lab is one of the foremost forensics laboratories in the country. There are experts on every type of evidence, from bullets to fibers to vehicle parts to nuts. The FBI's knot expert analyzed the ligatures from the tamper victim's wrists and throat. They had been removed intact in hopes they'd tie the killer to his deed. They might also say something about his past. Specialized knots might reveal that he had been a merchant marine or in the military.
but the ligatures turned out to be tied in granny knots, simple, functional knots that anyone might have tied. An FBI fiber expert analyzed the fabric found near the body. He brushed particles from the cloth onto a sterile sheet. What traces had the killer left behind? The analyst scanned the particles with a magnifier, but he didn't expect to find much. Such evidence is easily lost through weather or other contamination of the crime scene. In fact, the rule of thumb for fiber evidence is in four hours, 80% is lost. In 48 hours, it's 96%. After three days, the chance of finding anything is almost nil. So he was amazed when he found a small speck of red nylon fiber. It was trilobal, meaning it consisted of three lobes and had a lustrous or shiny coating. From its size, type, and shape, he guessed it was a carpet fiber, maybe from the killer's car. The fact that it was there at all was a minor miracle. The analyst from the FBI lab told the Hillsborough detectives to keep the discovery secret. If this were a serial killer, publicizing fiber evidence could make him change his pattern or his vehicle, so he'd be harder to find. The FBI's tire lab also scored. From the tire casts, they determined the tires were of two different brands. All were well-worn and mounted reversed with the black walls facing out. An irregularity like that could be powerful incriminating evidence. Back in Tampa, police identified the victim from a fingerprints the day after her body was found. She was Lana Long, a 20-year-old Laotian woman, a popular exotic dancer in Tampa's red light district. Her boyfriend had recognized her from a newspaper photo and had called police. He became the prime suspect. Officers questioned the girls on the strip but received no information implicating the boyfriend or anyone else. They were stumped. Then, just two weeks later, the calm of another holiday weekend was broken. On Memorial Day Sunday, Detective Pops Baker and Lieutenant Gary Terry of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office were called to a second murder scene, again in an isolated rural area off an interstate. Uh, young female, late 18, 19, 20 range. Like Lana Long, this victim was female, in her late teens to early 20s, and nude. She was also bound at the hands and throat, and had a knot at her neck with a leash-like extension. But this knot was different. It was a hangman-style noose. I can remember driving all the way to the crime scene and saying to myself, please don't let this victim be bound. In 1984, we very rarely had homicide victims bound. That's the first thing I asked the officer protecting the crime scene when I drove up, is she bound? And he said, yes, sir, she is. So we've gone from very rarely having victims bound to two within two weeks. So we knew we had a problem. This woman had not been dead long. She's still warm. Because the crime scene was fresher than the last, more evidence remained. Detectives found a man's olive green t-shirt and some strands of hair which they determined were not the victims. Hanging from a bush a few feet away from the woman's head were her white pantyhose and white jumpsuit, both covered with blood. From the brutality of her wounds, Detectives knew she had fought for her life and that it had been a savage struggle. She had been raped, strangled, beaten, 
and her throat had been cut almost from ear to ear. The medical examiner reported three causes of death, asphyxiation, head injuries, and a lacerated throat. As before, Baker found tire tracks. Casks were taken for analysis and comparison to the ones found at the first murder scene. Once again, the crime scene evidence was hand-delivered to the FBI lab in Washington. Analysts found the same red, lusted trilobal carpet fibers as at the first scene. And this time, there were red trilobal delusted fibers too, with the shiny coating absent. It said fiber evidence is the silent witness, but this match seemed to scream that the cases were linked. Lana Long's boyfriend could not be tied to the second murder, and he was cleared as a suspect. The items found at the scene also provided other clues. The green t-shirt was a size large, suggesting a person of medium build and chest size. The head hairs were medium brown, from a male Caucasian. These two pieces of information began a physical evidence profile, which are shared with other law enforcement agencies. FBI tire expert Sandy Wersema analyzed the tire impressions and made another match. The tracks were the same as those from the first murder scene. Now she knew the position of each tire on the car and that they were mounted on a mid-sized vehicle. The advantage of having a cast over the photograph is that I can actually pick the cast up, I can light it from different angles and different directions, and hopefully if there are any cuts or nicks or um, rocks that are caught in the tire, I'll be able to see that in the cast. But perhaps the best clue came from what she didn't know. She knew two of the tires with a common Goodyear Viva brand, but a third wasn't on the FBI's extensive reference list. One of the tire impressions they could not identify from their files. But what they did was gave us the name of a tire expert, a manufacturer out in Akron, Ohio. And we actually flew a detective, Corporal Baker flew out there personally with the tire impressions, met with the old salts out there at the tire factory, and they actually were able to identify that tire for us. And that was the Vogue tire. And in 1984 was a handmade tire that comes as standard equipment on Cadillacs. We had never even seen a tire like that before. Mm -hmm. Police were told that if they found the car with that tire mounted black walls out, it would be as positive an ID as a fingerprint. Analysis of the victim's knife wound revealed that the killer had a knife with a three-inch blade. Now we've got two victims, both bound and both connected forensically. So we knew we had a serial killer on our hands at that time. It's just a gut feeling that I get. Lieutenant Terry began to track the killer's strikes on a map hoping they'd reveal a pattern of behavior. He put out the word to patrol officers, look for a white male with brown hair of medium build, driving a mid-sized car with the tires reversed. He may be carrying a knife with a three-inch blade. Following the FBI's recommendation, Terry didn't mention the fiber evidence or the ligatures. From a composite drawing released to the media, the second victim was identified. 22-year-old Michelle Sims had a criminal history of prostitution. She'd been reported missing the day before. A key member of the Hillsborough County investigative team was Detective Randy Latimer. At this point, though, we realized we're dealing with a serial killer that it looked like he was uh, probably uh, preying on prostitutes, so 
uh, we went out into to the areas of the known prostitute areas and then started contacting the girls and, and let them know what was going on, giving them our business cards that if they saw something strange to contact us, let us know. We're looking for information. We were frustrated that we couldn't, we couldn't get any leads, we couldn't get anything to go on. Then on June 24th, another Sunday, Terry, Baker, and Latimer responded to a third murder scene. A worker had found a body in an orange grove. It was another female. But the pattern seemed different. This one was fully clothed, and there were no ligatures, so there was no reason to believe it was linked. Well, as you can see. But detectives didn't rule it out. Looks like it's been undisturbed for quite some time. They delivered the victim's clothing to the FBI lab, just in case a connection could be found. This time, the fiber expert they had worked with before was not available, and someone else was assigned. He wasn't asked to compare the new evidence to the old, so he didn't. Nor did he begin the analysis immediately. The body was so badly decomposed it only weighed 25 pounds, including clothes. It took some time to get an ID, and when it finally came, the victim's lifestyle didn't fit the pattern either. 22-year-old Elizabeth Ludenbach of Tampa was a shy assembly line worker who lived with her family. She had no criminal history and was not a prostitute, although she did frequent bars on Tampa's Strip. A note in Elizabeth's room said to find her boyfriend if anything happened to her. So detectives ordered a polygraph test. I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. You just need to answer yes or no to those questions. Do you understand? Yeah. Did you know Elizabeth Luden back? Yes. Did you have a relationship with Elizabeth Ludenbeck? Yes. Did you ever harm Elizabeth Ludenbeck? No. He failed the polygraph test, making him the prime suspect. It wasn't until mid-September Three months oh, really? after the discovery of Elizabeth's body in the Orange Grove, that the results came in. Yeah. The FBI had a match. Yeah. They found red carpet sense. fibers identical to those found in the first two murders. Looks like Ludenbeck is ours. They Good. found red fibers that connected up. Now they had three related killings. Terry entered the new scene on the map. Any kind of significant difference? Every detective on the homicide squad was working the case. The nature of the investigation began to change. Instead of focusing on boyfriends and neighbors, detectives pursued an unknown killer terrorizing the women of Tampa. We've taken the entire homicide unit now, are concentrating on these cases, and we're running down leads, we're getting telephone calls about different people, and we're checking those leads out. We're doing a background investigation of these particular victims, and we're coming up to empty. And all we have to do is unfortunately wait and then there's another victim is discovered and that is victim number four after a lull of more than three months the calm of yet another sunday was shattered on october 7th a worker found a body near the entrance to the k-bar ranch in northern hillsborough county this time detective steve crib was assigned to help process the scene he, Terry, Baker, and Latimer didn't have to look far for the first grim piece of evidence. The victim's bra hanging from the entrance gate. 
The nude body of a young black woman was nearby. Her clothing was beside her. Most of the detectives ruled her out as a serial victim. She had been raped, but unlike the others, she had been shot, not strangled, and there were no ligatures. Also, she was African-American, and usually serial killers don't cross racial boundaries. Get her into a controlled environment, we'd be able to really While the FBI analyzed the evidence, detectives identified the victim from fingerprints. 18-year-old Chanel Devon Williams had just recently been released from jail on a prostitution arrest when she disappeared. She was last seen working the red light district along Nebraska Avenue with a friend, another prostitute, a few days before. She had been dead about six days. The FBI's hair and fiber analysis revealed it was the work of the serial killer. Both types of red fibers were found on Chanel's clothing, along with a brown Caucasian pubic hair. By crossing racial bounds and using a different weapon, the killer had changed his routine. Shifting from a pattern is very rare in serial killers and would make this one more difficult to capture. Chanel was added to the map near the Pasco-Hillsboro County line. With four dead, detectives were desperate to find the killer and obsessed with the case. You don't work these cases. You live and breathe these types of cases. You go home at night, you dream about this case. You eat and sleep it. I would go home at night and just look at the telephone, waiting for it to ring. Every Sunday, for some reason, the first series of bodies were discovered on Sunday. On Sunday, I didn't plan anything. I sat at home. Indeed, the Sunday after Chanel's body turned up, Terry, Baker, Latimer, and Cribb were called to another murder scene. This one was near Lake Thanodosassa, northeast of Tampa. A couple of amateur archaeologists had uncovered a morbid find. At the side of the road was a woman's body, wrapped in a gold-colored bedspread, tied with a blue jogging suit. Inside, her lower legs and ankles were bound with common white string. Her hands were tied in front of her with a red bandana. She had been bound, raped, strangled, hit on the forehead, and dragged through the dirt. It seemed the killer was back to his old pattern. The woman was quickly identified from fingerprints as 28-year-old Karen Din's friend. Raised in an affluent suburban household, she had died a drug-ravaged prostitute. She was last seen alive in the early hours of the day she was killed. As if there weren't enough to link the killer to the crime, investigator Steve Cribb actually saw red trilobal carpet fibers on Karen's body. By now, he developed a sixth sense for them. When you know what you're looking for, they almost look like glow worms on the, on the victims. But for the average person to walk up and find them, even the other investigators who weren't looking for this type, they wouldn't see them. But uh, they became such a key point of the investigation that when we went to a crime scene, that's one of the first things we would look for with the carpet fibers. At the FBI lab, the fiber expert compared these fibers to the ones from the other crime scenes. They matched. There were now five cases linked to a single killer, but there was still no name, no face, and no one under arrest. It becomes very frustrating that you know someone else is going to die because you haven't stopped the suspect. Um, you have enough information to know that he's doing it, but not enough information to pick him out of the crowd if he were to bump into you walking down the mall. Because you have to remember in this series of cases, our concern is if we don't stop this guy, if we don't find him today, he's going to kill somebody tomorrow or the next day, and when in fact he did. 
Two weeks later, on Halloween, another victim emerged. A contractor digging a ditch found the mummified remains of a woman's body. Terry, Baker, Latimer, and Cribb arrived at the scene. The medical examiner estimated the body had been there for about a month. The body was badly decomposed. An ID would require special measures. The FBI lab needed to soften the skin on the hands in order to get fingerprints. As hard as the victim was to identify, detectives instantly recognized the killer. The body had been completely mummified. The head had been separated by animal activity. Uh, there were no ligatures attached, no clothing. And again, you just look at the body and you realize it's him again. You just have that feeling by now of the crime scenes, of seeing body after body after body, that it should be the same killer. And in fact, it was. Then at 7.30 a.m. on Sunday, November 4th, a call came in to Tampa police that seemed unrelated. A man reported his daughter had been abducted and raped. Seventeen-year-old Lisa McVeigh was leaving work at a Krispy Kreme donut shop on her bicycle. It was around 2.30 a.m. A man snatched her off her bike, threw her into his car, and drove off. He held her at gunpoint, reclined her seat so no one would see her, and told her to remove all of her clothes. He took her to his apartment, bound and gagged. She'd been sexually abused before, and she knew how to read the moods of an abuser. Lisa sensed resistance might send this man into a rage. So she quietly did what he wanted. Lisa memorized all she could about her surroundings. At first, she peeked out from beneath her blindfold. Then when he uncovered her eyes, she saw everything, including his face. She was certain that now, he'd never let her leave alive. He took her to his bedroom and repeatedly raped her for 24 hours. Sometimes he slept, but she knew he was armed and that he'd kill her if she tried to leave. After a full day of captivity, the man told Lisa to take a shower. Then he gave her some clothes and made her a sandwich. To her amazement, he said he would take her home. At around 3 a.m., they drove toward her neighborhood. On the way, he stopped at a 24-hour teller machine to withdraw money to get gas. Peeking under her blindfold, Lisa continued to memorize details. The Howard Johnsons, road signs, the word Magnum on the dashboard of his car. He finally released her near her home. After Lisa's adoptive father reported the abduction, she was interviewed by Tampa police officers. I want to ask you everything that happened um, the night when you left work, and I'm going to record you. They were amazed by her almost total recall and fierce resolve to catch the rapist. Well, um, I always leave work about 12 o'clock. 
I got on my flight. Although Lisa had not been killed, there were many similarities to the Hillsborough cases. The abduction, the rape, the man's build and hair color, and even the red interior of his car. Tampa police sent Lisa's sweater to the FBI lab. We were inundating the FBI lab with things to compare for fiber samples. Rape cases, assault cases, anything sexually related, and a violent crime, we were sent to the FBI lab for a fiber comparison. Meanwhile, just a week after the last body was found, Pasco County detectives were called to another murder scene. On November 6, 1984, a woman's body was found on the same road as the fourth victim, Chanel Williams. Only this time it was to the north, in neighboring Pasco County. Pasco detectives called Hillsborough detectives to a vacant lot near a mobile home park. If you look right here. The body was in a different county, but the ligatures and fibers were all too familiar. Although the body had decomposed to mainly bones, the telltale leash was still attached around the neck. A little bit of shoelace, right around here. here. There was That's another ligature on an arm bone. It must appear to be Near the body were the woman's tattered blouse and panties and some jewelry. The bones were scattered over almost an acre. When the medical examiner pieced them together, they seemed to belong to a young, white female. She was later identified as 18-year-old Virginia Johnson. Ginny divided her time between Connecticut and Florida, where she worked as a prostitute. She disappeared on her way to buy cigarettes about three weeks earlier. After all that time, it seemed impossible, but the FBI lab found a single red, lustrous fiber in Jenny Johnson's hair. Within the week on November 12th, another jurisdiction fell prey to the killer. A body was found on an incline off North Orient Road within Tampa city limits. When Terry and Baker arrived, they found a young white woman, nude but for knee-high stockings. She was face down. When they turned her over, police knew from her bloodied face that she had been savagely beaten and that she had struggled. There were ligature marks on the front of her neck and on both wrists and arms, but no rope was found. Her wadded up blue jeans and flowered top were near her body. Detectives Baker and Cribb immediately saw something stuck to the blue jeans, tiny red fibers. In the pocket of the jeans was the victim's driver's license. Kim Marie Swan was a 21-year-old part-time student who sidelined as an exotic dancer. She was last seen leaving a convenience store near her parents' home the previous afternoon. It seemed the killer had pulled off the road and thrown the body out of his car. There were faint tire impressions in the grass near the roadway. They would match the casts made earlier. The killer was picking up the pace of his killings, and the body count stood at eight. Terry and Baker were desperate. They drove to Atlanta to meet with a detective who helped crack the case of Wayne Williams, a serial killer believed to be responsible for 27 murders. Because something we didn't really want to share publicly in 1984, what do you do when you're 10 bodies, 15, or 20 bodies down, and you don't have the suspect in custody? What do you do? We were sitting down in their office discovering. And during the course of that conversation, the telephone rang. And it, the, the telephone call was from the FBI in Washington. And the FBI lab says, we have just had a match on a piece of fiber evidence submitted from a rape case. And I was blindfolded. That case turned out to be the abduction and rape of Lisa McVeigh only a week earlier. Well, um, well, Tampa police had rushed Lisa's clothing to the FBI lab and experts there had found matching red trilobal carpet fibers on her sweater. It was the break they'd been waiting for. I want to play it. Terry flew back to Tampa immediately. He formed a task force of officers from the Hillsborough and Pasco County Sheriff's Office, 
the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the FBI, along with the Tampa police detectives already working the rape case. Then he divided them into teams, each with a different assignment. They initiated a massive manhunt. Patrol cars fanned out across North Tampa. They were looking for the killer's apartment and his red Dodge Magnum. The information from Lisa McVeigh was their roadmap. The additional personnel and resources brought in by the task force stepped up the search for Lisa McVeigh's abductor. Because the perpetrator used an ATM, one team of investigators subpoenaed the November 4th bank records for all local automatic teller machines. Another team subpoenaed a select list of all the Dodge Magnums in Hillsborough County, almost 500 cars. Then they compared the bank records and the list of Magnum owners looking for a name that matched. And the unique thing when you looked at both lists is that one name jumped out at you is Robert Joe Long. He had a money transaction from the money teller machine, early morning hours. He also was a registered owner of a Dodge Magnum. In addition, earlier that day, a task force team from Tampa spotted a red Dodge Magnum on Nebraska Avenue, the killer's hunting ground. The detectives stopped the car. They told the driver they were looking for a robbery suspect. From his license, they identified him as Robert Joe Long. They photographed him and wrote up a field report. He was cooperative, but wouldn't let them search his car. Uh, of course, they contacted the task force uh, headquarters uh, when they made the stop, and we told them go ahead and stay with it at that particular time, stay with the car once it left, and, and we put a surveillance team together then to stay on him. At that time, a photo pack was assembled, a lineup of photographs, in which he was placed in that photo pack. That photo pack was shown or displayed to Lisa. She looked at it and said, that's the guy that kidnapped me. She pointed out Bobby Joe Long. Lieutenant Terry had his man, but he couldn't risk making a mistake with a quick arrest. He needed time to obtain warrants and organize his team. To ensure public safety, Terry ordered non-stop surveillance of Long. Units followed Long's every move in unmarked cars. Maybe he sensed they were on his trail because he started cleaning house. Officers cleaned up right behind him. Even when he vacuumed his car, police seized the vacuum. They retrieved everything Long thought he was destroying. After months of tracking a phantom killer, the task force was not about to let him slip away. Less than 24 hours after Lisa McVeigh identified Bobby Joe Long, the arrest plan was firmly in place. The task force moved in. They had followed Long to a movie theater. I'm right over here, Stewie. As he watched the film, undercover detectives watched him. Long seemed unaware he was surrounded. We're sitting at the war room we had constructed down at the operations center we're in, and everything is just going 90 miles an hour. We have a surveillance team on the inside of the theater watching it. There's a surveillance team outside watching the car. And that nagging doubt comes to you. Is this really the guy you've been chasing for eight months? Is this really the guy that you, has been killing these women? So we tell the surveillance team outside, listen, whatever you do, get up to his car. I don't care if you have to low crawl, whatever you have to do, get to the car and tell us what kind of tires are on the car. And the surveillance team came back and said, hey, there's, there's Goodyear Viva tires on the car. They're all black wall. And he said, there's some oddball tire here named Vig Vogue, something like that on the car. As soon as he said that, we knew. When we pulled up and saw the car, saw the tire, the Vogue tire that had been described from one of our uh, tire impressions, when we saw the seat that, were, that revolved, that, that laid back, 
the red carpet fiber, there wasn't a doubt in our mind that we had the right suspect. Terry gave the order to arrest. Detectives followed long as he left the theater. He was never out of their sight. They didn't know if he was armed, so as he approached his car, they jumped him and brought him to the ground. He didn't resist. He was on the ground when I walked up to him and placed my badge next to his face and identified myself as a deputy sheriff, advising him he was under arrest. They took Long's car to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's office garage. Steve Cribb immediately tore out a piece of carpeting and rushed it to an FBI fiber expert flown in from Washington. Meanwhile, Randy Latimer and members of the task force interviewed Bobby Joe Long, who had declined his right to an attorney. I heard you out on the street that you got some uh, cuts and stuff on your hands and arms. Did they take care of all that for you? Oh, yeah. Just a couple scrapes. Okay. They were well prepared, having consulted the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI Academy on how to conduct the interview. Detective Price. Um, just where you want to start. The game plan was to start by addressing only Lisa McVeigh. Long confessed immediately. Well, I went down there and uh, parked my car. After, after he admitted to the rape and abduction of Lisa McVeigh, we talked about uh, why he let her go uh, and, and what went through his mind and what went on. Um, I, I rolled into questioning him about uh, prostitutes. Have you ever picked up any prostitutes? Um, he told me he had in Miami. I asked him about here. Um, and, and he said, well, he might have. Then they began talking to him about the murders. He initially denied it, committing any of the murders. As the interview continued, the FBI fiber expert examined the carpet from Long's car. He compared this sample to the others. It was the moment of truth. As soon as they looked, put them on the comparison microscope, the FBI agent called back and said, bingo, it's a match. The carpet fiber from the car matches the carpet fiber from the different homicide scenes. It's probably helping me out at this point. Excuse me. Terry told Latimer the news. Then Latimer explained it to Long. I mean, we just got information. He told him about the fibers and their significance, and about Long's brown head hair found at the crime scene, and the Vogue tire. Latimer let Long know that by the time they found the second body, they were already on his trail. Uh, what can I say? The evidence was overwhelming. And he looked. He looked down, he had, his, he had his legs kind of, his knees spread apart, and he looked down between his feet, and I said, yeah, I did it. I said, did what? He says, I killed him. You killed who? He says, I killed all those girls. All those girls in the paper, I killed. Um, and, and then we just started going through them one by one after that. Thing, but then it just became more and more, you know. Long described hard, each murder in a taped confession. Thing, the interview lasted five and a half hours. Bobby Long showed Hell, no emotion, no remorse, uh, it, it, was, it was just a, an everyday conversation like you and I are having here. Yeah. At the end, uh, I don't remember if it was myself or Bob Price had asked him why he did it. And he said that that was his secret and he was going to take it to the grave with him. During the interview, Long also confessed to a ninth murder. When detectives found her remains, they also found more of the tiny red carpet fibers. The victim was identified through dental records as 21-year-old Vicki Elliott, a waitress. 
Long also helped identify his sixth victim, whose body had been found on Halloween. 22-year-old Kimberly Hops was known by the street name of Sugar. She was last seen by her boyfriend getting into a maroon Chrysler Cordoba, probably Long's red Dodge Magnum. Late that night, Lieutenant Terry called a press conference. The media thought police would announce yet another body. They were shocked by the arrest. How long have you had this suspect? Bobby Joe Long, and he's presently been charged with 10 homicides that have occurred over the course of the past six months within Hillsborough County, Pasco County, and the city of Tampa. He was arrested without incident and has subsequently confessed to several of the homicides under investigation. Do you have evidence for all the homicides? Yes, sir. Open five. In the coming days, Hillsborough detectives learned they weren't the only ones tracking Long. Task Force member Charles Troy, a Pasco County detective, stumbled upon the truth. He realized that Long fit the description of a man who had raped a Pasco woman months ago. Troy scoured Long's apartment for evidence. He found a photo album filled with photographs of nude women, including the rape victim. In jail, Long confessed and bragged about the crime. Detectives had also found clothing and jewelry from Long's other victims. It's a common quirk of serial killers to keep photos or other trophies of those they kill. Detectives soon realized that Long was the classified ad rapist, named for his M.O. He canvassed the classifieds for women selling beds and other furniture, and when they let him in, he brutally raped them. He had never been apprehended. Long may have raped more than 50 Florida women in the 1970s and 80s, some even during his murder spree. Now with Long finally in jail, Detectives reflected on lessons learned. It just shows the importance of physical and trace evidence, shows the importance of the cooperation with the laboratory and what they can do for you, and the effort that you have to put at a crime scene. There, the hours you need to spend there, you, don't, you, you can't rush. You just have to be deliberate, take your time, and be professional in what you're doing. Because oftentimes the answer is sitting right there in front of you. And the smallest speck, the smallest little piece of information may be the one key that breaks this case. Uh, As detectives got ready for the Thanksgiving weekend, they thought the horrifying eight-month string of killings was finally behind them. They packed up the boxes of evidence and hoped some semblance of normalcy would finally return. But even then, a quiet holiday seemed to evade them. On Thanksgiving Thursday, a couple out walking found a skull, bones, and some clothes, as well as three pieces of rope, including a leash-type ligature. But what he really enjoyed was the pain, the torture, and the torment, and the control he exercised over these victims. You can see that in the early crime scenes with, with the leader, the leash-like attached to their neck, where he choked them out of consciousness. Then the victim wakes up, and he's still there astride her, raping her, torturing her. That's where Mr. Long got his enjoyment, his kicks. Killing, just eliminate a witness. He could do that without any compunction, without any, any trouble at all. When a forensic dentist linked the body to a missing persons report, Long confessed. The victim was Artis Ann Wick, an 18-year-old bride-to-be who had vanished from a northeast Tampa street corner on March 28th. She had been missing for eight months. Ironically, Wick was the first victim taken, though the last one found. She brought the known death toll to 10, but Terry has always believed there were more. I'm confident he's killed other women, other people. Uh, are we going to find those bodies or discover those other cases? I don't know that we ever will. 
Bobby Joe Long was never convicted in the classified ad rapes, in part because the statute of limitations had expired by the time he was caught. He did receive six life sentences and 693 years for attacks on women in 1984 and 85. For the Hillsborough murders and the rape of Lisa McVeigh, Long received 33 life sentences. He was sentenced to death for the killings of Virginia Johnson and Michelle Sims. After sentencing, Long left the courthouse whistling a tune. Mr. Long is, is a killing machine. He became very proficient at what he was doing, very skillful at it. And if Mr. Long ever sees the light of day, all you're going to have to do is follow the trail of his other bodies, of his other victims, because he will kill again. He enjoyed it. Long remains on Florida's death row with no date set for his execution.